Good morning. It's good to be with you. I don't know if uh, some of you probably don't know me, but um, I had a part of the beginning of this church, and um, I'm just really thankful to be back. I'm thankful for the investment that this church has made in my life. Um, I was able to preach my first message at this church. Um, John, uh, Pastor John, has had a special impact on my life, and um, discipling me, mentoring me. So I'm thankful to be back here and to exam- examine scripture with you. Um, the passage that I want to look at with you this morning is found in First Peter chapter 1. And uh, John contacted me two weeks ago and asked if I wanted to preach because he was out of town. And one of the messages that I've been uh, working on is dealing with the topic of freedom. And obviously, uh, this weekend, interesting enough, we are celebrating uh, the freedom that this country experiences. Um, Obviously, you know, back in the 1700s when the uh, Declaration of Independence was stated, you know, stating that the 13 colonies were freed from the British, uh, the, the, the state of England, or the country of England, These states were declared as united and free. And so this weekend, many people will celebrate independence. Uh, They'll celebrate history, um, government, traditions, and whatnot. But what I want to take a look at is what is freedom? What does it mean? And um, to do so, I want to start off by reading our passage today. And then once we read our passage, we will uh, begin in a word of prayer. So it says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and in order for us to understand truth and your word, we need your spirit to give us eyes that see and ears to hear. All of us have hearts that in its own state is living in darkness and it does not let light in. And so there are people in this room that are running from you and that are chasing after darkness, and uh, they are not experiencing freedom. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to understand what freedom is and how it changes our life. And so I pray, Lord, that you'll give me the words to say, and I pray, Lord, that you'll give us the hearts to hear, or the ears to hear and the hearts to change. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So every time I come home and I get off the exit at 77 and start going through Strasburg and hit 250 to come over to here, I'm always struck with the fascination of the Amish. Um, one of the things I really enjoy every time we, we're going down 250, you start seeing the, you know, the Amish buggies. And I enjoy explaining to Chris, who's not super familiar with the Amish culture, explaining the differences. You know, as you guys know, they, they have different houses. You know, they, they drive, some of them have different buggies that they drive. And 
um, their lifestyle is different if you just drive like a mile down the road. And the reason why is because the bishop there determines the rules and regulations by which that church is supposed to, to how they're supposed to live. And, you know, with the Amish, as you all are well aware of, it's a religion. You know, their theology believes that if you are good enough, if you follow the rules, there's hope for you because one day when you stand before God, you just hope that you'll be good enough in this life. And as their religion, as they live in their religion, it's less of a relationship with God because it's all about what they do. You see, their search for freedom in the afterlife, spiritual freedom, leads them to death because there's no hope for them because they could never measure up to God's standards. So you have these Amish that are living a strict religious life. And they're seeking for freedom in the afterlife, seeking from spiritual freedom, or for spiritual freedom. But it leads them to a life of trying to be self-righteous. And then one thing, another fact that I find so fascinating about the Amish is when their kids come of age, most of them will go through the process of sowing their wild oats. And so then you have these young kids who start living life to the fullest. I mean, you guys, you guys see them. I, honestly, I miss. <laughs> I miss going to the local Buffalo Wild Wings and seeing these kids walk in. And, you know, you'll see them dressed in their Amish clothes. They'll walk in, and they'll walk out dressed as normal citizens. Why are they doing that? It's because they're trying to find satisfaction in life. A lot of them will turn to pleasure, drugs, alcohol, Massive parties, clothing, materialism, sex, you name it. They're, they're looking for something to give them a source of control and freedom from the life that they have lived so far. As we know as believers, they are seeking for something that will never satisfy them. And in fact, just as their parents, they're seeking for something, they're seeking for life but the things that they're seeking after leads to death. And I find it interesting because if you see the parents and the Amish and then you see these young kids making decisions, they're both looking for the same thing, but they're not finding it. Because the parents are strict and religious and they have no relationship with God. They're enslaved to their religion. These kids are looking for pleasure, but they can't find satisfaction because they're enslaved to the lust of the flesh. It sounds familiar. If you look at the Gospels and you look in Luke, it sounds like the story of the prodigal son. You have one son that spent his life serving, but without a relationship. And then you have the other son who spent his life wasting it away by seeking for pleasure. And I think it's interesting. In that parable, often we can identify ourselves with either the prodigal son or the son who was sent or spent his life serving. So the question this morning I want you to ask is, which one are you? Do you think that you are righteous on your own? Do you believe that you're, you don't need forgiveness because you don't need what Jesus has to offer because you're good enough? Or do you think that pleasures of this life is the answer to your problems? Because if you do so, you don't have a need for Jesus. And I think the thing that is so wonderful about the gospel is the gospel is both for the prodigals and the older brothers because they both were enslaved to a lifestyle. And so it takes a miracle to be delivered from both blinding self-righteousness and blinding self-indulgence. Scripture teaches that there's two types of people in this world, just two. There, There are those that are in Christ and there are those that are not. 
this question is, determines the difference between truth and error. Are you in Christ or are you not in Christ? It's the difference between godliness and wickedness. It's the difference between heaven and hell. All of us here in this room, we have, we have different social backgrounds, um, environments we grew up in, struggles, we have different ages, um, we have different families, different birth orders, jobs, hobbies, relationships. You know, the list can go on. We are unique individuals, but as I said, everything boils down to one simple question. Has Christ Jesus set you free? And that's what I want to talk about with you all this morning. Has Christ Jesus set you free? So in order for us to know if we have found freedom in Christ, we need to know what we need to be set free from. Our passage this morning says this in verse 14, Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. So every person outside of Christ lives by the passions of the flesh. Um, speaking of those that are in Christ Jesus, it talks about in verse 18, if you are in Christ Jesus, you have been ransomed for the, from the futile, futile ways inherited from your forefathers. All of us are sinners. And sin is like, it's like smoke. It, it permeates a room. Uh, and sin permeates every aspect of our life. And when sin enters, it impacts everything. Sin is, such a, sin is such a dominant theme throughout all of Scripture. I find it interesting that out of the 1,189 chapters of the Bible, there's only four chapters that don't mention sin. You know which ones they are? Genesis 1 and 2 and Revelation 21 and 22. Because from the very beginning of humanity to the end, Sin is such a dominant theme because it affects every aspect of our life. Sin affects both our bodies and our souls. This past, you know, First Peter, or Peter's writing to people that are in persecution, and he's, he's encouraging them in this passage that the flesh, we wrestle with the flesh, we struggle with it. And it affects both our bodies and our souls. It affects every entire, our, our entirety of our being. The, obviously, the body, when we die, it decays. But the spiritual aspects, aspects of man, including his thinking, reasoning, and desires and affections, represent our soul. And our soul is affected by sin. I want to take a look at Scripture and see what Scripture says about how sin affects us. So, sin both affects our bodies and our souls. Sin affects, number one, our mind. Paul says in Titus chapter 1, verses uh, 15, To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consci consciences are defiled. Romans 8, 7 through 8 says, For the mind is set on the flesh, is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The mind is set on the flesh. So we have, number one, we have the mind. Number two, we have the heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, um, it speaks about our heart. It says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Sin is also universal. No one does good. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And interesting to note about our passage in verse um, 18, it says that, we have been, as believers, if you're a believer, you have been ransomed ransom from the futile ways 
inherited from our forefathers. So even sin affects families in different ways. So if you have a dysfunctional family, which is probably every one of us in here, that sin that you easily see in others, whether it's your parents or your siblings, is in you. It's deeply embedded embedded in the very fabric of your being. And it's easy to grow resentful and bitter, or bitter towards those that are evil. But often we don't recognize that evil is within. It doesn't take long for us to realize that we live in a time of spiritual darkness. And it shouldn't be a surprise because spiritual darkness doesn't allow the light to come in. First um, Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which is at war against your soul. Against your soul. And so what Peter is making very clear is that everyone is at war with the flesh. And so the question that we have to answer is what is the flesh? Obviously, we've talked about sin and what that means, but in our terms, what is the flesh? And this is a helpful definition that someone told me. The flesh is trying to make life work without trusting God. Foundationally, living in the flesh is trying to control your own life apart from God. It's idolatry. Living in the flesh is idolatry because anything other than God that captures your hearts and your minds and affections more than God becomes about control. We live in a world that is filled with choice and control. All culture is centered around that. We kind of have the impression that we live in a world with, with many choices. We can control our destiny, right? The American dream, you are free to choose what you, how you want to live. But I think this, this myth, this at, the unsatisfying part, can leave us overwhelmed, paralyzed by the amount of choices we have in our life. Because, let's say, for instance, you enter into the grocery store. It's overwhelming how many types of ketchup are on the shelves. How many types of cereals there are on the shelf. You enter into any any store, there's different kinds of brands represented. There's so many different uh, styles of clothes, so many different styles of cars Houses, we're inundated with so much choice in our life. And if you keep multiplying that, it can become paralyzing. Most people will probably hear what exp- would it express their lives as to be busy. Just sheer simple business, busyness is a dilemma for most people in this country, in this culture that we live in. There are too many things to do. And that is, of course, the other side of the result of believing that we can control our environment by expressing how many choices we have. So the end result of living in the flesh is burnout, depression, feelings of discouragement, Losing hope, feeling unsatisfied, and all of those personal emotions are a result of idolatry. Things that don't satisfy, trying to make life work without God. And so the question we have to answer in our own life is, what are we trying to make work without God? What captures our heart. What is it? What is, what is it the part of the flesh that we struggle with? Is it our relationships? Do we struggle to say 
no, because we care about what, to, what people think of us. Or maybe, maybe you isolate yourself from people because people annoy you. They make you uncomfortable. Maybe it's your career. You're trying to get to the next level and anything else doesn't matter because that is what is going to give you the most freedom in life. Maybe it's appearances. You spend so much time on your phone looking at what's the trends. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Um, you know, I, I, work, I work with youth. And one of the things that's, it, it blows my mind is if you try to keep up with the style, like socks, let's take for instance for socks, you have your ankle socks, and then you have your socks that you pull up that are like, you know, come up to your calf. I was like, okay, so what's the cool way to wear your socks now? And like, one day it'll be ankle socks, and the other day it'll be like the halfway socks, but then you fold them down. It's like, there's so much different ways to express yourself, and everyone's trying to fit in. We're looking for other people to approve us, and our freedom is, uh, is only attained by the approval of other people. Maybe it's money that you're trying to pursue. Maybe it's success or recognition. And so the question is, this morning is, that we need to answer is, what do we need to be set free from? What is it, the aspect of our flesh that grips our hearts, our minds, and our affections. Because all of us struggle. And your truth that you, the truth that you deem as true affects the way in which you live. And so all of us, as I mentioned, we have a problem with evil. We have a problem with sinful hearts. And so therefore we need solutions. We need to be rescued from our own self our selfishness. And so what do we need to be set free from? We need to be set free from the flesh. So the next question is, well, how are we set free? Well, our passage says this. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, And if you call on him as a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. God is a judge, and he does not judge with a bias. And because of that, all of us are in trouble. Because as I just mentioned, all of us struggle with the flesh. And Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. And just like the Amish that are pursuing after righteous deeds to save them, that can never save them because righteous deeds are like polluted garments. And so God's standards for righteousness and perfection and holiness is the opposite of our flesh and sin. And just as God can't let sin remain unpunished, there has to be a legal transaction that takes place in order for us to be set free from the power of the flesh. In verse 18 of our text, it says, everyone needs to be ransomed from their ways. Ransom meaning we need to be bought out from our sin. There must be payment. You see, condemnation is the sentencing of the sinner to punishment on behalf of his sin. And all of us deserve to be sentenced to eternal death and condemnation because all of us are sinners. But thanks be to God, he provided in Jesus Christ a substitute. Later in the book, 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. You see, in God's grand scheme of salvation, he provides a substitute. God doesn't just remove his wrath towards our sin. In his mercy, he provided 
a substitute in Jesus Christ. And so God doesn't cancel his wrath towards sin. There must be payment, and that payment was spent on Jesus. Jesus absorbed God's wrath, and Jesus diverted the wrath that was meant for me and for you. God's wrath was just, and it was spent. It was spent on Jesus. And so, if you are not bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you are not in Christ. And those that are not in Christ will experience eternal condemnation. Only those who receive pardon from judgment are those that are in Christ. And so the question is, how are we set free? We are set free by the finished work of Christ on the cross. In our passage in verse 20 says, so that your faith and your hope are in God. In order to be set free from the powers of the flesh, we need Jesus to rescue us, to save us from our sin. And the beautiful thing about when you think about a legal transaction, it's, it's final. You see, when Jesus died for us, and when we have faith in him, we have hope. Because in verse 20 says, Who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. So for us as believers, our judgment day is behind us. But for unbelievers, their judgment day is before them. Because our freedom is purchased with an imperishable currency by the blood of Jesus Christ. So as a believer, we live in real time. The past verdict stands for today. There is no condemnation if you are in Christ. Romans 8 mentions that. There is no mistrial that can be tried down the road with prejudice. Because if God declares freedom in Christ, then it is done. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. John 8, 36. See, freedom is never, never free. It costs something to someone. And spiritual freedom costs Jesus his life. Personal goodness can't save you. Obeying the golden rule can't save you. Only what God has done in Christ can save you. And we can never do that for ourselves. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. And so in order for us to have a relationship with God, we have to be set free from the flesh. And that can only come through the finished work of Christ. And so we see that what we're set free from is the flesh. And we see how we are set free. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so the next question that our passage answers, what are we set free for? I love this. Faith in Christ, it saves you from not only the penalty of sin, the judgment of sin, it also sets you free from the power of sin. Gravity doesn't cease to exist, but it can be overcome. When you're in a plane that's cruising three or 30,000 feet in the air, is gravity still at work? You better believe it. But there is something inside that plane that is greater and stronger than the downward force of gravity. And just like the flesh, the flesh is still at work. But we have something that is greater and stronger, or stronger than the, the, the gravity and force of our flesh, and that is the spirit of God. You see, we're called, we're called as believers to not, uh, Peter mentions, to not be deceitful, to not be hypocritical, to not envy, to not be slanderous, 
But to be free from the flesh, and to be free from the flesh, is, it's, it's like a distant concept. Because all of us are dealing with things that bring us down. We, we are dealing with our flesh on a daily basis, and we struggle. We struggle in life. We struggle with addictions. We struggle with, with um, pain that makes us hurt because we feel like we carry the weight of the world. If you evaluate your life, you probably do not feel a sense of freedom. In fact, a lot of us live our lives feeling captive to other people's opinions of us. We let things affect our mood, whether it's politics, um, people. We can't achieve our goals. And so we get lost in the midst of it. And we lose sight of what God has called us to. And what does he call us to? What does our text say? In verse 13, he says, prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so, as we go and we're set free from, set free from the flesh by Christ, we're supposed to live with minds that are engaged. And we're supposed to be sober-minded, but it's reliant on God's grace. And the only way that you can be engaged, set your mind on truth, is to be reading his truth, to be in God's word. Because everyone is going to tell you what their truth is. And if as believers we don't understand what truth is from God, we have nothing to stand on. And then verse 14, it says, as, be, as obedient children, don't follow your old passions. We don't have to go back to living in the flesh because we're saved from that. And then verse 15, it says, be as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. We're supposed to be set apart from those that are living in the flesh. And then verse 17, it says, conduct yourselves with fear. The fear that informs you of all of life. And then lastly, we're supposed to set our faith and hope that that is in God. You see, we're set free to be conformed to the image of God. God's Son, Jesus Christ. God doesn't just save us so that we would just go to heaven, but that we would be holy and that we would be conformed to the image of his Son. And in being conformed to the image of the Son, that changes everything. I, I wrote down a couple things like things that I know I struggle with and I'm sure some of you struggle with, this changes, like, how I seek approval. Like, I, I don't need to live for the approval of other people and fear rejection. Because I know that I am accepted by the one in whom God of the entire universe has already said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because Jesus has took my humiliation and shame and he gives me his favor power and control. I don't need a position of power and control. Because in Christ, our future is secure. I don't have to chase after clinging to power because in my weakness, he is elevated. Because in Philippians 2, it says, above all authority and power, so that in my weakness, now his strength and power is made perfect. So that when I am weak, I am strong. I don't need money or material things because you don't have to build your life around money and all the stuff that it can buy for security. Because as a believer, we have real wealth that can never be taken or shaken in Christ. Second Corinthians 8 9 says, In him... Now I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I no longer need success or recognition because 
We don't have to be a big deal to chase after success or achievement to prove our existence in the world. Because Christ has already done what we could never do, and he has given us a name above all names, and he knows me and calls me by name. Living in the flesh leads to death. Only those that are in Christ. have a life that leads to eternal, eternal life. And when we are saved, we're not just saved to exist, we're saved to be like his son, Jesus. And that is so kind of our, our Lord to give us purpose in life. Um, Pastor John gave an illustration Many years ago, I don't know if he's used it since then, but I'm going to borrow it for him. <laughs> and to illustrate this concept of being bought and set free, there was, in the 1800s, during the slave trade, there was this miner in California that had struck it rich, and he was coming back, and he, he oversaw a slave auction happening. And during the slave auction, there was a young woman that stepped to the podium and it was clear that the people that were bidding for her wanted to ruin her life and to take her life from her. And as the bidding began and exceeded the price of of any man, this miner called out double the price that was worth any man. And as he bought this girl and took her, it was immediate resentment this girl had for this man. She called him names, was hateful, angry towards him. And eventually he took her, he went to this little building on the street, on the corner of the, on the road, and she saw this man arguing with this guy and saw that there was more money laid on the table. And she was confused and what was going on. And as the tensions rose. He eventually walked out and handed her a piece of paper and said, here are your freedom papers. You're free to go. Her, thinking that he was just kidding, responded with the response, I hate you. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. These are your freedom papers. You're free to go. And all the more the resentment grew in her eyes. And it wasn't until a time after that she really realized this man had bought her freedom and was letting her go. And her response to that as she started to weep was, now that you bought me, my response is all I want to do is serve you. And I think that is the exact representation of what this passage is saying. We are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And our motivation is to serve because he loved us and he sets us free. Folks, we live in a fast-paced world filled with distractions. And many of you guys aren't experiencing freedom. Your flesh is dominating you. You're trying to control your life. Every aspect of your life, your relationships, your your jobs, careers, whatever it be. And simply, that's not how we're supposed to be living. Everything in life is sacred, but, but we, we worship the creation rather than the creator. And so my encouragement to you all is simple. There is a freedom that can be found. And it's not in government or politics. It's not the country. It's not, it's not protesting for the right thing, necessarily. And all these things can be good in and of themselves, but only freedom comes from finding your identity and what Jesus has done for you. As I mentioned earlier, there's only two people, those that are in Christ and those that are not. And I implore you to find your freedom in Christ. And as John says, 
who the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm going to close with a song. And it goes like this. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. But as I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost, you looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath reserved for me. Now all I know is grace. Now, Lord, I would be yours alone and live so that all might see. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. O oh, Father, use my ransom life in any way you choose, and let my song forever be my only boast is you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, freedom in Christ flies in the face of what our culture tells us. It's the opposite of what we think is freedom. Because we want to control our own life. But we know that when we control our own life, that leads to death. And so God, help us to be free from our own flesh. To be set free. And to have an attitude of service because our life is not our own. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to believe this. To give us the grace to see. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.